Class of 2014, your commencement speaker, the Vice President of the United States. Mr. President, members of the board, thank you for the great honor of conferring this honorary degree on me, and uh, thank you for the privilege of being able to address uh, the graduating class of 2014. I am uh, I'm truly grateful to the faculty and distinguished guests, parents, grandparents, family, friends, all friends of all the graduates. Uh, congratulations to all of you, and a special congratulations and thanks to those of you in the graduating class who are going to be commissioned in the United States military and who are veterans of this class. Would you all please stand, those being commissioned and those who are veterans in this class, so we can thank you for your service. Thank you. Those of you who are about to join, you are about to join the finest, and this is not hyperbole, the finest group of warriors in the history of the world. That is not hyperbole. The folks you're about to stand next to shoulder to shoulder have never seen their peer in all of time. I've been in and out of Afghanistan and Iraq over 25 times. I've seen what they do, and I wish all Americans could see what was done. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, you're part of a remarkable generation of warriors. I've never been so proud as when I'm standing among them or when I stood with my son in, Af in Iraq toured there for a year, and so many other young women and men that I know. And again, thank you, thank you, thank you. And for all the parents and all in this incredible arena, just remember, we still have 33,000 warriors in harm's way. One percent of this nation has been doing the fighting. But 99% of us owe them a debt of gratitude. 300,000 have come home and are coming home with unseen wounds of post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury. There are more, it's estimated, more amputees from these two wars than any war since the Civil War. When all the parades are over and all the streets are renamed, these women and men will still need us to keep our sacred commitment. There is only one truly sacred commitment this nation has. We have many commitments to the elderly, to the infirm, to our children. There's only one sacred commitment, and that's to prepare those we send into harm's way and care for them and their families when they come home. And so I hope 20 years from now, when the commencement speakers are standing here, he is bragging about the fact the United States kept what will be an incredible continued financial commitment to care for those who were wounded with seen and unseen wounds. I can think of no state in the nation, with the possible exception of Pennsylvania, that has as many veterans, as many dedicated people dedicated to our military. So those you're about to serve, we owe you. We owe you. We're indebted to you. And thank you for your service and the service you're about to undertake. Ladies and gentlemen, it's great to be back on this great campus. Uh, no reason why you would know this, but I've been coming here since 1974. I have spoken on this campus in different iterations at least uh, close to a dozen times. And uh, I've always been impressed. But what I've been most impressed, I was talking to the President about, 
is how much has changed over the years when I came here as a 30-year-old United States Senator. It's just gotten better and better and better. I say to people, Mr. President, over my career, friends will say, my child got into this school and that school. Which school should they go to? And I give the same answer. Go to the school you can get into now where you're certain you wouldn't be able to get into it in 20 years. <laughs> That's this school. The last time I was here was to help dedicate the library collection of one of my closest friends, Senator Fritz Hollings. I've also seen a lot of uh, South Carolina students at uh, the Carolina Cup. You seem to spend a lot of time there, too. <laughs> and I have a lot of friends in this state. The mayor of this great city, Steve Benjamin, is one of my great friends. Jim Clyburn is the heart and soul of this state. And Senator uh, Lindsey Graham, who is a very close friend, although in a lecture he wouldn't want me to acknowledge that, I suspect. <laughs> We disagree, but uh, if he gave me a call in the middle of the night and said, Joe, show up at 7th and Vine in the middle of St. Louis, I'd get in the plane and go, and I know he'd go for me, even though I think he's wrong on a lot of issues. <laughs> you know, I thought I knew an awful lot about uh, the Gamecocks, but then eight years ago, I hired a guy named Fran Person. He, he played football down here with Coach Holtz and then Spurrier. And from the day he came on, all I've heard about is South Carolina this, South Carolina that, South Carolina football, South Carolina baseball, South Carolina's number one equestrian team. Half you didn't even know that. I, you know, the number one school, the number one school of international business in America. Now I have to hear, now, my Secret Service agents and I have been hearing for the last month. I can tell you he's going number one. I can tell you he's going number one. Clowney's going one. Well, he went one. And Connor Shaw, the guy who never lost a game at home, is still here. And then there's Lattimore. I'm so tired of hearing about it. I played football at Delaware. I mean, you know, I wasn't supposed to become an aficionado of the game, Cox. But I just want you to know I draw the line, Mr. President, of South Carolina claiming great athletes here. I want you to know Dawn Stanley, she's ours. Now, let me tell you why. I followed her Hall of Fame career since she was the number one recruit out of Dobbins Tech in Philadelphia, which is my backyard. I married a Philly girl, so we claim Dawn. I want you to know that. You may have her, but we claim her. You know, that's all what you get when you hire a former offensive guard who played here at 293 pounds and married a South Carolina girl. You know, the truth of the matter is I was anxious to come, but even if I didn't want to come, I would have been afraid to tell Fran I'm not coming. Uh, so thank you for the invitation, and thank you for uh, uh, the memories I've had when I've been here, and please uh, um, give me some help and get Franny off my back, okay? You know, I've been around long enough and done enough commencements at great universities like the University of South Carolina uh, to have gained enough wisdom not to offer you any advice. But I would, with your permission, like to make a, uh, a couple of observations. The first totally unrelated observation is your parents are selling and celebrating today because they're all getting their first, first pay raise in years. <laughs> no tuition next year. Congratulations. As some of you may have read in the national press, I was listed for years as the poorest man in the United States Senate. When I got sworn in as Vice President, the Washington Post had a headline that said, this is, I believe, a quote, it's probable no man has ever entered the office of Vice President with fewer assets than Joe Biden. <laughs> I assume they were talking financial assets. That's because I made the mistake of making the promise that your parents made to you. Whatever school you could get into, I would get you there. All three of my children gathered two degrees from universities are now $55,000 a year. Uh, it's amazing that I still have a home. But <laughs> so, folks, enjoy the raise. Enjoy the raise. Um, but. Uh, on a more serious note, 
The observation I'd like to make is that, uh, to state the obvious, no graduating class gets to choose the world into which they graduate. Every class, as they step off this stage, faces unique challenges. Every class enters the history that has been written up to the point that they walk off the stage. But few, probably no more than nine graduating classes over the recent history of our country, starting in the 20th century, have ever entered at a point in this country's history where they genuinely have a chance to write a new chapter, to bend history just a little bit, just a little bit. And I would suggest that your class has that chance. I acknowledge that it creates great anxiety, probably more among your parents than you. I get it. I understand, because the generation, my generation, the generation of some of the women and men up in this platform face similar questions of uncertainty as they graduate. In January of this year, the magazine Politico had a headline. It said, Stop Worrying, Learn to Love Decline. Not long ago, the Washington Post reported, quote, the world is baffled by the fiscal cliff, sees it as a sign of America's decline. The July after I graduated, the same publication had a headline that said, pollsters report decline in U.S. standing around the world. I remember the headline as I walked up the stage for my law degree at Syracuse when the Wall Street Journal has said, U.S. in worst fiscal crisis since 1931. What those voices did not understand then and do not understand now, that as my generation and yours graduated in one of those inflection points in American history where the world was changing no matter what we did about it. Remember when you were in undergraduate school, when you were in high school, if you took physics? I remember my physics professor explaining what an inflection point was. He said, that's that point where you're riding down the highway at 60 miles an hour, two hands on the wheel, you turn the wheel to the right five degrees, and you will not be able to get back on the path that you had been on before. That's an inflection point. It happens only every so often in the history of a nation. My colleagues in the Senate always quote, always kid at me for quoting Irish poets. They think I quote them because I'm Irish. That's not the reason. I quote them because they're the best poets. <laughs> but William Butler Yeats wrote a poem called Easter Sunday, 1916, describing the first rising in Ireland in the 20th century. And there's a line in that poem that I would argue better describes the world into which you're graduating than it did his Ireland in 1916. It says, all's changed, changed utterly, a terrible beauty has been born. All's changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty has been born. A class that graduated 10 years ago today in this Coliseum faced a different world. All has changed. The balance of power fundamental alterations of a global economy. In Yeats's world, a terrible beauty was born. All that means is that the old answers and the old politics 
of the previous generation that had served the country well for a long time no longer had much applicability to the world you're graduating into. The day I graduated was in the midst of a nuclear escalation and tensions between the United States and then the Soviet Union. More nuclear warheads were being be built. There was great division in the country over the civil rights movement. The year I graduated, Dr. King and Robert Kennedy were assassinated on the eve of an upcoming election. The war in Vietnam had literally fractured our society. Our budget, as referenced, was out of kilter, and political dysfunction in our society was viewed as close to chaotic. Nevertheless, as I and my colleagues strode across that stage to pick up our diplomas, we had confidence for we knew there were incredible possibilities as well because of changes taking place in the world that the generation before us didn't quite understand. We ushered in an information age that shrunk the world beyond the recognition of our parents. In the ensuing years, we laid the foundation for an incredible period of technological innovation in a generation of significant wealth and prosperity. We moved from nuclear escalation to nuclear reduction. We finally secured civil rights for African Americans. We raised the cause of women in society to an entirely new level. And an environmental movement that did not exist began to flourish, which is going to be yours to finish. And we ended the war in Vietnam. And we secured the United States a position in the world continued position in the world as the strongest economic power in the world. But those answers, those answers are not particularly relevant to the world into which you're graduating. Today, you're graduating in a world that's changing equally as profoundly. Different dangers, but it has incredible possibilities and significant tools to deal with those dangers. The planet is warming, and we wring our hands. Even the climate change deniers are seeing the light. Climate change is a gigantic problem for the world and your generation. But as my fellow recipient of an honorary degree can tell you, it has generated, no pun intended, an incredible amount of rapid growth and renewable energy and alternative sources of energy. Ladies and gentlemen, it has prompted not just your generation, but the generation immediately before. Electric vehicles traveling 300 miles, an hour, 300 miles and filling up with electrons cheaper than gasoline will be your generation. Solar energy, as cheap as coal and natural gas, will be generated before the end of this decade. We've already increased tenfold the amount of renewable energy in America. The era where utilities were able to make as much money, so that you're in an era where utilities will make as much money saving a kilowatt hour as generating a kilowatt hour of energy. Some of you and your parents may think I'm too optimistic. But I know the history of the journey of this country, and it is always, always, always forward. When given a chance, the American people have never, ever, ever, ever let their country down. To paraphrase a famous man, it bends toward progress. Just look at how much has changed in the last eight years since you graduated, since you were in high school. 3D printers now are able to restore tissue after traumatic injury or restore skin damaged by fire to unblemished skin. Hospitals now, as the nurses in this operation can tell you, are testing the printing of organs for organ transplants. The ability to regenerate organs and limbs 
that have been damaged and lost, saving tens of thousands of lives and restoring wounded soldiers so they can be fully capable is on the horizon. It is within our grasp. I can take you this day to the Intrepid and show you thought control prosthesis, legs and arms that help people climb mountains, play the piano, something beyond your comprehension or that of your teachers when you entered high school. You may have seen in the front page of every major newspaper in America the bombing that took place in Fallujah, standing in front of the town hall, an American soldier in full battle rattle with a prosthesis, with an artificial leg, able to operate fully. Speech recognition that's on your iPhones has gone mainstream. Software that translates real-time conversation into multiple languages. You can pick up a phone today, and you'll be able to do it with ease within a matter of several years. And call someone in India, speak in English, and they will contemporaneously hear it in Indian or Urdu. <clears throat> Folks, I'm here to tell you what's going to happen. The ability to engineer your white blood cells to attack cancer tumors, leave them healthy, the healthy cells untouched, allowing cancer patients to live with a chronic disease without depending on difficult and painful chemotherapy and radiation procedure, but to live a full life. Sequencing the entire human genome within an hour, delivering rapid, personalized medicine. Investments in private and public sector innovation will mean supercomputers performing a million trillion calculations per second, which is 100 times faster than the fastest computer on Earth today. It will literally, those of you with science backgrounds, it will literally transform and revolutionize science, medicine, and applied technology. Strong, lightweight materials that are already available increasing that are used by NASA, cheap enough to use in cars and trucks, <coughs> and wind machines, wind turbines, making them more durable and energy efficient than anything we have ever, ever seen. We're talking about putting on new materials on aircraft carriers on which you can land our most sophisticated jets that's lighter, lighter than any plastic and stronger than any steel. Self-driving automobiles, I promise you, before you're 35, those of you who live in urban areas will get in your automobile, program it, and study on your way in, and there'll be fewer accidents. It's already beginning to start. Reducing traffic fatalities, uh, fatalities by 80% while freeing up your commute time to work, vastly improving productivity. The fear of pandemic disease is real, but it's also propelled an entire generation of scientists to find the tools not only to prevent disease, but to cure diseases that once were viewed as impossible to consider dealing with. You will see a world within the next 15 years where the vast majority of hunger is vanquished by crops that don't need soil, water, or fertilizer, or pesticides to thrive. As my fellow recipient knows, the DuPont Company and others in Pioneer are already producing these kinds of materials. International terrorism and stateless actors are the threat to your generation, but they have the perverse impact of bringing together traditional state adversaries and common cause to wipe them out. We're about to enter an era of breathtaking change and progress. 
We're on the cusp of innovations that will literally change the world in which you live. And we're better positioned than any nation in the world to lead the 21st century. Our security is guaranteed by a military that is 10 times larger, or put another way, that is larger than the next 10 nations in the world combined. Do you hear me? Larger than the 10 next nations combined. China, Germany, France, Russia, all of them. As I said earlier, our warriors are the finest, best equipped and best trained warriors in the history of the world. Our economy is two and a half times larger than, larger than the next largest economy. Our workers are three times as productive as Chinese workers. High-tech manufacturing is coming back to the United States and energy is cheaper and more plentiful in America than in the continents of Europe or Asia. And the epicenter of energy production beginning by 2020 will not be the Arabian Peninsula. It will be the United States of America, North America. That's happening at this moment in large part because we have the best research universities in the world. We have a legal system that's fair and open and transparent. We have the most agile venture capital system in the world. And we lead the world in innovation and technology. It used to be when I, when I delivered the commencement, I believe it was at uh, William and Mary, I'm not sure. And I used the phrase, this was some time ago, where I said, and this has been going on since 1996, the Chinese, produce six times as many engineers and scientists as we do. That started in 96 or 94. Can any one of you name me one international product that has a stamp of China on it, one major new innovation that has occurred? Can you name me one? So much for China eating America's lunch. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to see China go, want to see Europe grow, but they're not in our league if we take advantage of what's in front of us. What's in front of us. By this time you stand, before your children graduating from this great university, the vast majority of I've spoken of will have long been done. And all of it will not only change the way we live, but in the near, near term will create tens of millions of good paying jobs. It's out of total new industries. Every inflection point in history has generated jobs from endeavors that no one contemplated would exist. And you're the part of it. In fact, you're going to help build it. You're going to take advantage of it. So today, for all the uncertainty you may feel. Never forget, this future is within your control. Do not listen to the cynics. I know I'm always referred to in the national press as the White House optimist, like I'm the new guy in town. I'm optimistic because I said I know the history of the journey of this nation. So the only piece of advice that I will give you, of which I'm absolutely certain. The cynics were wrong about my generation. And two generations later, they're wrong about your generation. Graduates, as a statement of history, it has never, never, never been a good bet to bet against America. Never. And it's a bad bet to bet against your generation. For all the doubt, you are the most competent, capable, caring, equipped generation in American history. And again, that's not hyperbole. That is a reality. And I'm confident that you'll write a new and better chapter in American history, just like every generation has when faced with one of these inflection points. I have absolute faith, and I do feel in my heart that the possibilities are unlimited. So 
Only one thing. Don't listen to the cynics. The only time progress can be made is when change is occurring. That's the only time. There's that famous encounter between Steve Jobs and a student at Steve Jobs and a student at Stanford. The young student asked Jobs, and he's given a lecture about six years ago. He said, Mr. Jobs, what do I have to do to be like you? He looked at him, he said, think different. Two words, think different. You're all equipped to do that. Do not buy the orthodoxy. Great change only comes when orthodoxy is challenged. You're equipped to ch challenge it. Embrace it. Change it. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you.